Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Sarah Rosen Wartell. Uh, I have the great privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute and also to thank you all for joining us today online for this conversation. Despite appearances here, I am not actually at the Urban Institute, but in our uh, uh, guest bedroom, but um, uh, we are going to uh, make it work in a new way. Um, first, uh, let me do a few housekeeping notes. Um, this, evident, this event is being recorded and all of the participants are muted. During the panel discussion, we encourage you to share questions or comments and even put them in um, in advance in the Q&A box. And the panelists, we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can at the end. Um, I also encourage you to join the conversation in social media, Twitter, using the hashtag innovate for inclusive growth. Second, I want to say that I hope that you are well and that those you care for are too. Um, Right now, we are, all of us, handling much um, between a pandemic and the really stark reminders of the constant state of trauma experienced by so many. Especially for the Black members of the urban community, but for everyone, we are sending you our thoughts and wishes for peace and most urgently for society's progress. I also want to really thank uh, Shamina Singh and Mayor Nutter and all of our audience members for taking the time to join us today. And a special thanks, Shamina, to the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for their support of today's event and for this week's series. This is the culmination of a series of events and for the Accelerating Innovation for Inclusion initiative. A special thanks to my own team, Urban, uh, who are responsible for putting all this work together, Richard Aziki, Tracy Rutnick, Erica Pothig, Madeline Brown, and our events team, Amy Ellsbury and Haley Romer, for helping move our first major week-long series uh, to the virtual world. Today's event is the final installment in this week's online forum called The Equity Imperative. This series was initially designed to share a sense of urgency around understanding the implications of new technologies that were being employed by so many cities. We were looking at questions like when we digitize something like parking ticket payments or um, uh, business registrations, who has access to that? How can cities work with vendors or new service providers or um, new franchisees like scooters to help close access gaps and make sure that all have the same ability to participate in public goods and services? And how do we make sure that we don't exacerbate existing inequities when we do things taking advantage of technology? In short, where is technology helping or where could it help and who is it hurting and how do we be intentional about getting that balance right? When the pandemic hit, the danger of the digital divide was laid bare. As municipalities issued shelter in place orders to slow the spread of the virus, numerous dimensions of daily life for residents, numerous more dimensions of daily life for residents moved online. With employers shifting to telework, school moving online, cities relying on websites and live streams to disseminate critical information about the virus, Yet so many residents lack the internet access, the connected devices, and the digital literacy to fully participate in online work, education, and civic life. Further, the continued violence against Black people at the hands of police, the protests around the country, and the calls for accountability and justice illustrate to us that cities in the U.S. remain a long way from equity. In some ways, technology has provided a level of transparency for this that has moved us forward but in other ways, vulnerable populations remain disproportionately at risk for negative impacts of surveillance and tracking. In short, the urgency we set out to inspire with this event has been brought to us instead. We know that we have large systemic issues and even as cities have progressed into the digital age, many have been left behind. During this series this week, um, we heard that systemic issues require big visions and a full court press. And we're so lucky to have important partners here today and on the line who are wanna be part of that press. We heard from city technology equity and resilience officers in Atlanta, Pittsburgh, and Boston on our first day. And they were asking their private sector partners to keep the same problem solving energy we're seeing do during this pandemic to keep applying to solving the ongoing issues of health and equity that are persistent in communities beyond the health crisis. We heard from private sector and nonprofit representatives who are asking the cities in another event that they be clearer about what their equity goals are so that the partners can figure out 
where there's common ground and what the ground rules are. So many cities are figuring this out as they go and that's very hard for their partners. And we heard from the community advocates who emphasized that cities should be collecting thick data, data that's rich in context and lived experience in addition to big data. And they offer up public curricula for other communities to use to learn how to make sense of data and to use it to help advocacy efforts. So today I'm really proud and pleased to be in a conversation with two leaders. Each have public and private sector experience and to talk about how cities can focus on inclusive innovation during a pandemic and what we've learned about how cities advance equity that we can carry forward. So I'd like to welcome Mayor Michael Netter, Nutter, who is a former mayor of the city uh, of Philadelphia, and we are very pleased to say also a trustee of the Urban Institute. And also welcome Shamina Singh, founder and uh, president behind this extraordinary, uh, uh, and driver behind this extraordinary growth of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. So Shamina, I'm gonna start with you, if I can. Um, the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Bil Growth was built on this very concept of digital inclusion and advancing economic mobility. You've been doing this work for some time. Can you talk about how the center's work has shifted during the COVID-19 um, crisis? And how does the digital economy look different in these times? Shamina, I think you're muted. Maybe the you or the tech people could unmute you. There we go. Happy to uh, be here and be with you all today. Sarah, thank you so much for organizing the series. Mayor Nutter, as always, it's an, it's an honor to be on a, a panel with you. Um, you know, before I sort of jump into the center of what we've been seeing, which is significant, I just, I feel like it's important to sort of set a little bit of the stage of how at least I've been thinking about um, this work over the last few days, even, um, you know, with all of the things that you mentioned about what's just happening in this country um, right now. And I thought I actually harken back to the days where I was, work, I was working for Speaker Pelosi at the time she was minority leader of the U.S. House. And we were working on the budget documents um, at that time. And for many of you, I don't know if you remember Reverend Jim Wallace from Sojourner, but um, he and his group at the time started this, um, this wonderful conversation about how, and I'm going to just look at my notes here, because they said that um, budgets are a moral statement of priorities. Um, they tell us mathematically what issues, things, or people that the budget creators create um, and, who, and who, who matters more or less or what matters, you know, who is the least, who is the most. And so I, I was just thinking about this conversation, and I remember Robert Wallace's words that, you know, over a decade ago, which was when I was looking for Pelosi and when he was making the first round of this comment, how that still holds true today. But I guess now what we're seeing at the center and frankly what we're seeing across public and private sector is that a budget document is an output but the thought process and the values that go into that thought process are um, even more important now uh, than they were, you know, a couple of, even a couple of years ago. So at MasterCard, that means that we have bet on inclusive growth. We, as you said, Sarah, we have been working on these issues quite some time and trying to help folks like the Urban Institute with your help um, prepare for what we know has been coming, which is the digital economy. And so I guess COVID has accelerated our work, accelerated uh, the urgency, but we've always known that it was important to make the digital economy work for everyone everywhere. Um, and we've taken a lot of steps to make sure that um, our original bets around the digitization of small business through Grameen USA, um, uh, the partnerships that we've created with folks like the Community Reinvestment Fund, um, the inclusive growth score that we've created around economic development um, issues. So all of the places where you would think either by your zip code or by your access to networks that power the modern economy, um, we're making the right interventions in the right way and hopefully at the right time um, to really start to create what you've talked about, which is the technology transparency, but also recognizing that it's not the be all end all, that there are always, when there are humans involved with the technology, 
we have to confront the bias that even technology brings to the conversation. And, and can I just ask you to give us a couple of concrete examples? I know that, for example, MasterCard worked with uh, the LA to produce something that we've really been studying quite closely, which is the Angelina cards, which were essentially a direct cash benefit program for mm -hmm. residents of that city who saw their income disappear, including particularly many of those who may live in the informal economy. Um, um, I, I thought that was uh, an interesting example, but I know from you that there are actually probably dozens of those. And just to ground this conversation, maybe more than dozens, um, yeah. in some concrete examples about ways people are using technology to help people get through the COVID crisis would be just a good way to start the conversation. Yeah, so as you mentioned, you know, Miguel Gamino, who is a colleague of mine, was one of, on one of your earlier calls. And um, what we found is that using the assets of a payments company like MasterCard, which um, basically connect, is, are the rails that connect payments, buyers and sellers and the banks that serve them most of the time, um, we uh, worked with the, the Los Angeles, uh, the, the city of Los Angeles, when they created a fund. Um, to get worker relief and money out to um, the citizens of LA. Well, they needed a way to actually move the money. So as interesting and as, as enlightening as the concept of creating this fund and, um, and getting tons of uh, donations into the fund, we worked with them to very quickly um, develop the structure that was needed to actually move the money to people either on um, Angelino cards, as you mentioned. So if they didn't have access to a formal bank account or some way to get money, um, we worked with them very quickly to build the infrastructure that they need to receive the payments. Terrific. So Mayor Nutter, um, it's been a couple of years since you were in the seat of uh, yeah. former colleagues who I, I, can, uh, um, I can imagine you're having um, uh, a lot of empathy uh, and probably also giving a lot of advice to people who are um, yeah. managing through this crisis. Um, but you were, during your leadership in the city, you were beginning to bring technology and digital services to the residents of the city. And um, among those efforts were Philly 311, which is the city's first 311 service. There was something called Keyspot Network of public, yeah. private, nonprofit organizations mm -hmm. that provided tech and training for computer yeah. Can you talk about just how you thought about this set of problems and digital inclusion efforts? And as you've watched this crisis unfold, what do you think yeah. this is really <clears throat> for the moment? Well, Sarah, thank you. And again, uh, certainly, Shamina, uh, as you said, but I'm going to say back to you, always a pleasure uh, to be uh, on a panel with you and, and certainly uh, uh, connections now uh, with the Urban Institute uh, in a more formal way uh, as, uh, as a board member. But I've always enjoyed it. A good relationship with the Urban Institute and respect and admire the work. Um, I've always thought about technology uh, and especially of course the, the internet uh, as uh, the new uh, level I guess uh, if you will of civil rights struggle. When we think about uh, 50, 60 years ago uh, folks were marching and demonstrating and, and whether down south or up north uh, to have access uh, to a lunch counter, access to a job, access uh, to uh, areas of public accommodation. Uh, and now uh, the main issue for the 21st century is access to the internet. Uh, it is very difficult uh, to function uh, in this society today if you don't have access to the internet. Uh, and that was way before, uh, you know, we ended up uh, stuck in our homes or, uh, for the last, uh, you know, 80 plus days and now having virtual uh, conferences. Uh, we, we, we saw the disparities uh, and uh, the uh, lack of availability in so many uh, of our uh, urban uh, and I'm sure rural uh, environments. Uh, when schools closed, uh, uh, colleges and universities, K-12 space, everybody said, well, you know, we're going to teach remotely. Okay, fine. Uh, until whether in Philadelphia or other places, folks realize, A, a lot of folks don't have internet access in their home. B, uh, they don't have a device, a uh, laptop, desktop, uh, anything else to access it anyway, if, if they did have uh, internet service. And so again, many children, uh, whether in Philadelphia or other places, will be even farther behind 
uh, in 2020 uh, than uh, their peers, uh, whether in the white community or other communities that have that access, the ability or inability to do your homework, to do research. Um, you know, I don't know if there are any uh, young people on the, uh, I mean, like really young people uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, on the call today. Uh, there, there, there was this, uh, you know, but I, I feel comfortable saying that the three of us would know about, uh, you know, the Brit Britannica series of, uh, you know, uh, dictionaries. Uh, you know, that was the place. That was the source and the fond of all uh, information. And parents would save up uh, money uh, to be able to have that series and have all the books lined up. Uh, you know, I, I would suggest a young person today would have no idea what we're talking about. And so the ability to uh, fill out a job application, to uh, do research uh, for a job, for a college, a university, your homework, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's what 311 was about, uh, was connecting our citizens, their ability to connect to the city government, ultimately in a two-way fashion. It evolved over time. Again, you know, my timing uh, coming into uh, the mayor's office, maybe not the best timing in the world to uh, become mayor uh, during then what was considered the worst recession since the Great Depression. But, you know, we stood up that office within a year uh, and it grew and citizens have enjoyed it and been able to connect with their government. The key spots was the same thing. Uh, again, bringing the internet uh, to neighborhoods and nonprofit organizations and our rec centers uh, and libraries uh, for people to be able to, again, have access. And so uh, we now see in a pandemic uh, environment uh, uh, that critical need uh, is even more so. And then uh, in addition, uh, with civil unrest uh, and the demonstrations uh, around some serious uh, issues of race and inequality and, and uh, police brutality, the killing of uh, George Floyd, uh, the ability for people to connect, um, you know, again, uh, for some of our younger uh, viewers, listeners, uh, there was a time when there were uh, no cell phones. Uh, when social media uh, didn't exist. Um, and uh, you all now have the ability to literally in microseconds, nanoseconds, uh, tell the world what's going on uh, and uh, beam that uh, all over the place. Uh, and, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, we're the better for it, but we also have to know how to use it uh, properly uh, to communicate. Thank you. Um, and I want to come back in a little bit to talk about sort of lessons learned in this current context. But Shamina, before we do, um, uh, the mayor talked a lot about the role of the public sector. And um, earlier in this week, we spent a bunch of time talking about public private partnerships. And uh, that conversation underscored how valuable it is for public sector institutions to turn to the private sector to do things like providing devices or um, uh, connection points and things, especially during a crisis. But there also, the discussion highlighted a number of the risks there are that when you rely exclusively on private sector providers who may have different imperatives, not sometimes some of the considerations of the public sector, particularly around equity. Um, don't always get uh, expressed as first. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the private sector's role and the sort of principles that should inform the partnership between public and private? Yeah, and I think it's a great, it's a great point, but it's also, you know, it's also an issue that is very personal to me. Having spent, you know, the first 20 years of my career in the public sector and then taking the very good advice of my mentor, the former governor of Texas, Ann Richards, who said, in order to make the most effective public policy, you have to learn how money moves in the private sector and you have to understand the incentives. So her advice to me at the time was go learn uh, how to do this so that you can be more effective in doing exactly the kind of work that we're doing right now. And so I do believe that, you know, there is this moment now where you have seen a cross pollination or you're seeing more of a cross pollination between public sector people and private sector people. And you, look, everybody on this call knows that there are lots of things that happen by regulation and legislation and things like that. But many times it's about people picking up the phone and talking through what the right answer is for a particular situation. And so I think both formally and informally, there has to be um, more cooperation formally and informally between public sector people and private sector people. And 
most of the time, I think sometimes, or not most of the time, but uh, some of the time, that might end up being the same people. And so I would just sort of say that, you know, this is a conversation and point where, you know, Sarah, I've known you from a number of years, had a lot of respect for Mayor Nutter. Um, and so this, these are people talking to each other to try to figure these things out. So I guess when I say capital P private sector and capital P public sector, I kind of take it with a little bit of a grain of salt because I do think that, as Mayor Nutter said, it's all about um, connection. And um, so in terms of how we think about the unique assets, though, because I also really feel like we can't leave anything on the field anymore. And if you don't use all of the assets of the public sector and all of the assets of the private sector, we're leaving something on the field. And the, and the people who get left behind are the ones we're seeing today. And this is what you end up with. So I think the urgency of working together um, is more prominent now than ever before. Um, I would just say that, again, uh, as I started talking about um, uh, Reverend Wallace's comments, I think at least for the way that we've approached this at MasterCard and the Center for Inclusive Growth um, has been this idea of a decency quotient. So these, uh, and I want to demystify some of the process around the private sector work, quite frankly, because I do think that there is some the black box that somehow exists that private sector has all of the stuff that happens behind the scenes that nobody knows about. And so I would just sort of say, like the public sector process of budgeting, appropriation, <laughs> legislation, lobbying, advocacy, organizing, all of these things, you see these, I've, I'm here to tell you, it's a very similar process inside a private sector company. And so, but it's called things like um, strategy, it's called KPIs, it's called um, investor relations, it's called things like that. So it's a, it's a process that one needs to understand and become more familiar with in order to impact it more effectively. I happen to be at a place where the CEO um, uh, inculcates something called the decency quotient, which he sort of says that no matter what, it's about being decent. And that has to infiltrate every business decision. It has to infiltrate every product development decision. It has to infiltrate our um, development strategy and our go-to-market strategies. And so I do think that this, this trust factor between um, turning services over, if you will, um, has to be done carefully and has to be done with the most diligence that one would do. But I also think that there are a lot of companies that I'm seeing now, like some of these, uh, the, the ones who are racing for a cure around the pharmaceutical issues, who... Uh, we could probably make a lot of headway with if we start having a different kind of conversation. We call it commercially sustainable social impact, where you really do have to merge the social um, with the long-term profitability of a concept or a product or a service in order for it to have lasting impact and lasting sustainability across both sectors. So Mayor Nutter, I wanna pick up on that. When you were mayor, you negotiated with Comcast um, for a new uh, arrangement for their provision of services to the city. And yeah. there were two things that characterized that discussion, I think, if I have this right. One was that you were clear about what you were trying to accomplish in a way that uh, helped the company aim. But more importantly, that you made sure that resident feedback and their dissatisfaction was at the table. It was part of what drove the conversation. It wasn't just yeah. a government and private sector conversation, but the community w was in the conversation and their satisfaction became a goal. What are the lessons learned from that as you think about uh, so many of your fellow mayors now mm -hmm. having to implement so quickly so many new technologies to solve these problems? Sure. So you're, of course, referring to the uh, franchise uh, you know, agreement and uh, negotiation, which is usually on about a 15 year uh, cycle. Uh, Serena will appreciate this. Uh, the main lesson I learned, uh, we learned from that is that you cannot make everybody happy. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is still true. Uh, but, um, you know, I think both sides were either somewhat equally pleased or somewhat equally disappointed, uh, which probably means, you know, we, we, we may have gotten it somewhat, uh, somewhat right. Um, you know, it, it, those are tough uh, negotiations, but, you know, here's, I mean, for me, it was always about, well, I mean, my citizens are the ones who ultimately pay the bill, right? You can get whatever service you want, whatever tier, however many, um, you know, uh, 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 premium channels, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, your bill is, is what your bill is. But at the end of the day, you want high quality service. Again, it, it, 
you know, the, the content is the content, but for many people, uh, again, uh, they have that service because they need news and information. Again, they're trying to access, uh, whether it's programming or they use the internet service or whatever the case may be, uh, you know, as important in our lives, especially now in the COVID-19 environment, you know, as important as, uh, you know, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, and, you know, name a half a dozen others are, ultimately people need to also know you know, what is going on uh, with uh, the virus? Uh, how many people are sick? What, you know, what, are, what are the latest protocols on, you know, uh, you know hand washing and uh, masks? And, you know, this has evolved over time. And so folks have been glued, uh, you know, to their desktop, laptop, TV to get information. Information is power. Uh, and, uh, and so having good franchise agreement, having uh, citizen input, uh, it's always uh, very important to me. And while, you know, I'm sure someone would say, well, you know, you didn't get this part, or you didn't get that part, or you didn't get the other part. Um, I think the one thing I can assure you is uh, the many of the parts we got uh, were not initially on the table or agreed to uh, by uh, by the other side uh, for whatever those may have been. And so, that, you know, that's what a negotiation is. Uh, but I think the larger point, as you raise, uh, Sarah, is um, uh, we cannot be afraid, uh, and Shamina made the same point, we, we just can't be afraid in the public sector uh, of the private sector. You know, we're all operating in the same space. There are some mutual issues and needs uh, that, uh, that, that have to be met. And again, uh, access to information, shrinking the digital divide, getting broadband out in urban areas and rural uh, areas and the like uh, is still one of the most challenging issues. Uh, that this country faces and uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, has laid bare uh, the deficiencies of virtually every system uh, in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenges that we face going forward, I mean, I'd certainly be interested uh, from uh, Shamina's standpoint, and, and she knows that, you know, of course, I've worked with Michael Froman. Uh, so we've got a lot of public sector people now in the, in the private sector. You know, how is mm -hmm. the world of work going to change? How are we going to, you know, I mean, this is not the kind of thing I think, uh, I'm certainly not a doctor, uh, you know, I don't know that one day someone's going to say, okay, it's over. And everybody right. can just go back to doing whatever, you, do, you know, it's like a defined period of time. You know, it's not like a snowstorm. You know, there's a beginning, there's the moving of the snow, and then it ends, and then it's like all gone. I don't know that we're going to have that. And so many of the things that we're doing today to protect ourselves, may carry on uh, into the future. I don't know what all those things are, but um, society has been changed. And I think we need to acknowledge that. Uh, technology will continue to play a role. I mean, you know, I haven't been to the airport lately, but I think the next time I go, someone's probably going to put something up close to my forehead to see what my temperature is. Mm -hmm. That's new. I don't think that's going away. Um, I think we have to wear masks on an airplane, on the train. I mean, all of this stuff. Uh, how are people going to get that information? They're going to get it through a variety of sources. But if you don't have access to technology, you're going to get left farther and farther and farther behind. Uh, and we're in an environment where no one really can uh, be left behind. We don't have any disposable people here. So, Shamina, I want to take the mayor's question to you and just um, focus it on a particular aspect of this crisis. So and we can talk about the, the, the challenge she raises, which is technology's um, power to unfortunately uh, sort of harden the inequalities we have because some people don't have mm. access to it is worrisome. But there are ways in which technology mm -hmm. can actually expand access to people who didn't have access before. I'll give one example that came up earlier in the week was a city government where when they move their uh, city council meetings and hearings online, the audience for those increased 200 fold. Um, because now our events, we have larger attendance than we did when people had to get on a metro and leave their uh, homes or work. So there are positive things, although not everyone can still get on that, but probably more than the people who could afford to leave their kids without childcare could come to that city council hearing. I'm curious your thoughts about what are the positive dimensions of this that you most want to use your power and the work of the center to carry forward? And we, let's, let's talk about progress for a moment, and then we'll come back and worry about um, the, the perils as well. 
So I think, uh, thanks, Sarah. And I think that I'm actually old enough to remember when C-SPAN started and how revolutionary we thought being able to watch members of the House and the Senate um, speak on the floor and how that became a tool of communication and information. Um, and now that sort of looks like Facebook and now it looks like Twitter. And now it looks, so we sort of, this idea that Mayor Nutter raises around the power of information, I think is absolutely spot on. At the center, we've called this thing called, we've identified it as information inequality. And we actually think that the information inequality might be worse or might have a longer term effect on than income inequality because information inequality implies a capability deficit, um, which we've been trying to solve in partnership with organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, where we started something called data.org to build the capacity of social sector organize, organizations to take advantage of the data revolution that's happening. Already we're seeing that in this case, the private sector entities have zoomed ahead on data and data analytics. And what we're seeing is the mayor also pointed out is that unless we're able to make sure that the power of data and the power of data analytics extends beyond um, private sector into the people that it actually needs to serve the most, things like COVID will not go away. So in terms of where I see the positive um, coming out of this, I do see that this, we're never going to be the same again. As the mayor pointed out, yes, you will get a, temp, a thermometer probably, but you're also going to have a community health pass, or you're going to have to have some version of ID that says you're COVID free in order to move around the world or even in your community. So masks may stay forever until the vaccine at least, but you're going to have technological changes that say that have to prove that you're uh, COVID free or COVID tested. And those are all coming. They're all being formed right now in private sector companies. We're doing something in partnership with the Gates Foundation. Um, but you have to have, again, decency and equity, equity at the core. So I think that this time has actually catalyzed innovation in a way that maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't have seen beforehand. But I think it's also a time um, to rebuild and reconstruct with equity at the core. And I guess, Sarah, to your question, our goal at the Center for Inclusive Growth is exactly that, is to rebuild with inclusive growth at the core of everything we do. So, and, you know, you know, yeah, go ahead, please. The one thing I would say, and even with all that, uh, I, would, I would raise and express my deepest, deepest concern as to whether that technology makes it into uh, you know, the black community, the Latino community, low income communities, or even world communities, or, you know, in many instances, uh, when things come out, um, you know, on the private sector side, they get tested wherever they get tested, and then, you know, maybe some major uh, cities, but even that rollout uh, has to be done uh, with equity uh, in mind. And, yeah. you know, that it's not just a downtown thing, uh, or, uh, when it when it rolls out, I mean, I'm just being blunt with you here that, you know, sometimes uh, people in, in black community, communities of color say, oh, you know, oh, that that appears to be for white people, right? That, that's not about mm -hmm. us. And so it, it's about the language. Mm -hmm. It's about who's involved. What is this about? Is this important in my life? Uh, you know, look, I'm trying to pay my bills and now they come out with, you know, whatever the, the, the newest, latest, bright and shiny object is. And so, you know, our ability to communicate with people about what this is all about. Shamina talks about, you know, some kind of device, so it be an app on your phone, a thing on your wrist, whatever. Uh, you might not be able to go into this restaurant today. You might not be able to go, you know, from Philly to New York or down to DC or whatever the case may be. And then, you know, and somebody's standing there saying, you know, your, uh, you know, your thing says you're in the orange zone and not in the green zone. What? <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to go where I'm yeah. going. What are you talking yeah. about? Right? So, you know, it's all the education that goes with it so that people truly understand it, what, right. what's happening. But uh, I would also say, Mayor Nutter, that it's about the intentionality of building the product and build mm -hmm. and distributing um, the devices and the services in such a way that right. keep equity at the core. I'll give you an example. Right. Um, we, uh, you know, we have we had to double down on our bet on financial inclusion in the middle of the crisis 
Because what we saw happening was exactly what you described, which is, um, you know, as the race for a cure, vaccines, distribution, things like that, because we're a global company and because we were probably the first private sector company to devote $25 million to the Gates Accelerator Project to develop a vaccine and a therapeutic, the reason we did it with the Gates Foundation is because we said equity has to be at the core of distribution of a vaccine or a therapeutic or a diagnostic. And right. so if we're going to invest our time, energy, effort, and our people and our data analytics, this has to be something that is, at the, that is at the core. So I would almost say you have to be intentional, but that wasn't enough. So we had already realized that financial inclusion um, was at the core of what MasterCard knows how to do really well. And so we said, instead of stepping back from a commitment to make sure that people are included in the formal economy, we're gonna double down on that commitment, make an intentional decision as a company to say, what we know we do best, we're going to double down on that instead of back away from it. And so I think that that commitment to now, I guess we're up to a billion people that we're going to, we've committed to bring into the formal economy along with 50 million small businesses, by the way. So there's a whole commitment around making sure small businesses not only survive, but come back stronger after this is all over. It's about intentionality and it's about articulating your values through your actions just like Reverend Wallace said before. Yeah, yeah. So Mr. Mayor, um, when we had uh, both in, before the events this week in survey work and conversations we've had, and then in um, the dialogue that we had in one of these earlier sessions, one of the things that came up to us time and time again is that the, the people who staff the mayor's office who are working on equity, or the ones who are working on technology. Often they're very excited on the technology side about a new service that may be provided to their community. But that moment of introduction is the moment when you have the most leverage to ensure that you're intentional about equity. And so um, many of them feel, have said to us that they feel like they are inventing it without a playbook that this is the first time for the technology, maybe in their city, it's the first time to think not just about expansion of the, the service, but expansion of the service in an equitable way. And so many of them are feeling like they're figuring this out on their own for the first time. So I'm curious your thoughts about the, what are the best ways, um, you know, what would you advise the mayor to, how does he direct his staff to make sure they get this right? And what would be the best ways to build bridges so that the different cities um, can piggyback on the learning and the mistakes of other communities so that when you're introducing technology into the cities, equity is at the forefront? Well, first, I want to go back to something that uh, Shamina mentioned at the, at the beginning. She talked about, uh, is it Mr. Wallace? Reverend um, Wallace. Reverend Wallace. Um, you know, I would tell the folks that, uh, you know, a budget is uh, not just numbers. Uh, on a sheet of paper. Uh, it is actually a statement of values. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, as, as it said, where your heart is there, where your treasure be also. Um, and so it's really about people. Right? I had the great uh, honor and fortune of being responsible for a million and a half people. And again, uh, you know, acknowledge you might not be able to make everybody happy, you know, every day of the week, but it, it, that remains the goal. Uh, you have to tell your folks, new technology, old technology, the other thing I would say is, you know, mayors, you know, love being the first uh, to do something, you know, as long as uh, it's been shown to work before them. Uh, so, you know, those two, those two things are obviously in conflict with each other. Um, but you do want to know that it works. But I think with your staff, what you say is, yes, uh, this may be brand new. We may be the test site. What is this about? Why are we doing it? Who does it best serve? And how do we communicate it? And they have to know from the start that equity uh, and transparency and honesty are the fundamental principles of whatever it is that you're going to come up with. So, you know, we weren't the first ones with a 311 system. You know, New York uh, was a great leader in that regard. Chicago was a great leader in that regard. But we learn from each other. So, again, you have to ask what worked, what did. If you were starting the system again today, you know, what would you do? Um, we were the first major city in the country at the time uh, to have uh, equity 
in our bike share program uh, because we wanted to make sure that people in neighborhoods who might not have, um, you know, Shamina's working on this, but who might not have a credit card, that they could actually use the service. And so, you know, uh, working with the private sector, working with the foundation community, uh, we were able to, to do that. And so you see a program that is all over the city of Philadelphia uh, because that was about equity. And again, uh, you certainly see a whole lot of folks on bikes these days uh, in, uh, in the midst of the pandemic because, you know, they don't want to be on public transportation. So I think uh, Samina has used this word a number of times. I'm going to use it again. It's intentionality. It's clear direction. Uh, it's your values. Uh, and then, you know, let really smart people go and do their thing. Uh, but you, you ultimately, you have to stay on top of it and you're responsible for it uh, at the same time. Every now and then, something might not work. You know, be honest with the public, it didn't work. And now we're moving on and we're doing something else. But our values were right and our intentions were correct. Uh, and you know uh, that that's at the heart and soul of anything that you're trying to accomplish. So I want to invite our audience to use the chat box to share with us some questions for uh, the mayor and Shamina. Um, and I have two already that I want to, one for each of you, although feel free to weigh in on the other if you like. Um, Shamina, the first one was asking you to reflect, if you would, about the work you've done with data.org and others, um, uh, thinking about uh, the, the data divide in rural communities. There's a question here, we know so much less about rural communities. The infrastructure of those localities has so much less ability to communicate and store and share all of the things that the mayor has challenged as Philadelphia was in resources. The rural communities have so many more of those issues. So really curious if you have any examples from the work that you've been doing, particularly around the data divide, the, the knowledge of challenges and, and their equity implications. Um, are, do you see positive examples and how do, are you thinking at the center about making progress on the rural data divide? Yeah, so that's a, a big question, but I'll say a couple of things to try to get uh, us to some concrete uh, recommendations. One is uh, go to data.org and have a look because right now we have a $10 million challenge to create inclusive, uh, create data driven solutions to inclusive growth problems. So there's real money to figure out real solutions. And that can be from the urban center or the rural or from Taiwan or Topeka. The other thing I would say is think about it to the mayor's point and Sarah, uh, Sarah, your earlier question, information and network, the whole, the Center for Inclusive Growth, our model is built on the power of networks. The proximity of you, of you, of where you are to the networks that are powering the modern economy are determining your success. They could be virtual, they could be social, or they could be hardwired like electricity and water. But you have to make sure that you're, you're intentional about creating proximity to the networks powering the economy. In the instance of information sharing, I would say we, of course, have started something that Miguel talked about called City Possible, where we're sharing best practices around technology, data, and data analytics with um, mayors from around the world. So they are sharing best practices. We're inviting organizations to also join to make sure that we are um, feeding those in. And we also use networks like the U.S. Conference of Mayors, of course. We're working with Accelerator for America to make sure that as we target um, and, and along with Urban Institute as well, the Work Rise organization, as we target cities um, to really dig in around data and analytics, what is the prescription for change, um, how we work with the National Urban League, which we just gave a, a $5 million grant to, to really dig into economic empowerment. Those are all things that we have to make sure we're doing in order to talk about this idea of the data and the data divide. The last thing I'll say is, the Heartland Summit that we um, at a, attended a couple of years ago, sponsored, um, started by the Walmart um, family, I thought was a really interesting way to bring attention to the rural communities. It was there that we started thinking about our inclusive growth score, which is also available and which also allows cities or localities to look at the score of inclusive growth in your area almost down to the census tract. So if you're looking for information, we've developed a program that actually you can go online um, and look at the measurement of where your city is in terms of inclusivity. The final thing around rural is that we have been partnering for the Center on Rural Innovation, CORI, 
um, for two years for them to build out a, um, a program of innovation hubs across the heartland. And so um, Cheryl Dorsey also at Echoing Green has wonderful work she's doing on um, rural, uh, rural shared prosperity. So number of organizations in which we are involved with um, that, again, we lift up, we support, um, not only with grants, but also with data and analytics, technology, um, and expertise from our employees. Um, and let me just say on the rural question also, I think one of the great challenges that we face is getting um, in pandemics and with the constant change, getting real-time data that is disaggregated to the local. If you tell us about what's going on in a state, that doesn't mean people know what's going on in a census tract. And trying to figure out where our resources, our efforts at help, um, helping small business, others are, re are, are reaching, um, disaggregating the data by, the, by race and equity uh, and ethnicity um, for equity analysis, but also by geography so that we really understand where these communities are is gonna be really important challenge to sort of data scientists and researchers in the period ahead and, and, and MasterCard's uh, important partner in that work. Mr. Mayor, this is a hard one. And um, it's a question that many of uh, the current mayors are going to be facing, especially now in the wake of um, the, I think, increasing insistence that uh, we achieve um, equity um, in our cities that's coming out of the recent uh, criminal events. The question is, if you're turning to private sector partners to help you with technology, um, more and more of your citizens may be asking you to be um, asking of your partners that they share a commitment to a set of values. So I'll just mention the particular question says, how do you choose who you partner with? And do you insist that perhaps you only partner with folks who are willing to embrace anti-racist and strong inclusive communities or climate commitments or a commitment to living wage? As a mayor, whatever the particular issues, how do you think yeah. about that challenge? of on the one hand enlisting the power of the private sector, but also speaking to the values of your community. Sure, well, you know, again, um, uh, as uh, innovative, creative, unique, uh, as, uh, as any of us might think we are at any moment in time, more often times than not, there are some models and there are some examples. Uh, I'm sure both of you and many people listening will recall you know, in the 80s, uh, there were there was significant movement uh, around uh, anti-apartheid uh, activity in the United States of America and around the world. Much of that led by Reverend Dr. Leon Sullivan uh, out of Philadelphia and, uh, and OIC. Uh, that led to cities, colleges and universities, uh, and a number of others way before the federal government, um, putting in provisions in their uh, vendor agreements and purchasing agreements and relationships, as you mentioned, Sarah, uh, that uh, basically, if you did business with South Africa, you couldn't do business with us. And that movement uh, grew over a period of time and created an economic and moral environment, but certainly an economic environment uh, that ultimately resulted in significant change and the ultimate release, of course, of Nelson Mandela. I think given what has happened, um, COVID-19 and now uh, the, the flurry of recent uh, deaths of uh, African-Americans, uh, whether by police or uh, citizens and other incidents, um, you will probably see uh, more activity uh, from mayors, from city councils, from general assemblies uh, and legislators, uh, governors uh, on these issues of equity on these issues of race, I uh, just, I was talking to students from uh, a bunch of my classes from uh, Columbia University last night, and we noted in our discussion that, I mean, one of the things that feels different this time, the number of companies during the course of this week, corporate community, who have issued statements, I mean, large, loud statements about uh, issues of race, issues of equity, what's going on in the black community, police brutality, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, unlike anything that I've seen uh, in, uh, in in recent times, 
um, because I, I think that even the corporate community realizes that something we're at an inflection point, we're at a tipping point, a culmination uh, of a variety of events that people want to be on the right side of history uh, in this particular instance and state what their values are early, often, and uh, and upfront. And so, um, you know, there were there for for me when I was in office. I mean, there were certain companies uh, that we would not uh, do business with or even accept uh, support from. Uh, and that was, you know, based on our overall values as, as a city and citizens trying to take the pulse and have a sense of it. Not, you know, you're not, you know, seeing where the wind blows and, and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, hardcore values about who we are as a city. Uh, I think you'll see increasingly that kind of activity across the country. And lastly, uh, Shamina has mentioned every possible organization that I know and that I've worked with. Uh, the mayors uh, are, they've, they've been so much uh, activity, conference calls uh, and the like uh, during the course of this week. First of all, everyone is pretty much dealing with the same issue of protests uh, and, uh, and raising of the issues all across the United States of America. Everyone trying to figure out how to do it peacefully, lessons learned, what to do, what not to do. And that always continues. And the mayors learn from each other in real time uh, and also reach out from time to time to uh, old timers like myself and others uh, who have sat in the seat, uh, you know, <laughs> may have made some mistakes and we at least tell them what not to do. Uh, and um, those relationships are very, very strong. Uh, you know, as I say, once a mayor, always a mayor. And I care passionately about what's going on across the United States of America. That's why the work of the Urban Institute is so important. That's why uh, MasterCard and having Shamima there uh, and Michael and Miguel and others, uh, you know, it is, it, you know, we're all going to be here and nobody's pretty much going anywhere to figure out you know how to uh, how to operate in these environments but it continues to change so rapidly and again that's the that's the wonder and the challenge of uh, technology so i heard one thing in your comment mr mayor which was that it was helpful to the the public actors to have a common set of principles that you were all trying to move towards that and i would assume that's also the case for the companies uh shamina to have a, a clear mm -hmm. uh set of targets that have um wide support um uh, in the comments we have um uh, folks asking about um uh, these corporate statements of equity but also the companies being willing to hold be held accountable for meeting them and how we do that. So I wanted to see if you would tackle that. And then I want to come back to issues of ID and health um, verification and other things before we have a chance to close. Sure. So just very quickly, again, in my uh, small attempt here to demystify the black box of the private sector, uh, procurement is the path for the partnership between um, public and private sector. And so if the competition, if the competitive incentives are focused on the issues that Mayor Nutter articulated, that is an accountability mechanism because the, um, the procurement uh, process is how the partnership happens. And so I would say that the pronouncements are very interesting and fantastic, but dig into the procurement to see um, what, what the cities are actually looking for and what they bid, what they put out to bid. Um, I can tell you that we, despite all of everything I've talked about here and all of the, you know, the, the stuff that we're putting out and the intention and everything else, in the end, if you cannot show, you know, X, Y, or Z, because the procurement document says, you know, we don't really care about your inclusion statement or the fact that you've done financial inclusion or that you've built, you know, inclusive ID. We actually just care that you can, you know, uh, do it for this price, with this margin, with this thing. So I think it's about aligning incentives in the, in the contract process, like really digging into the details. That's one thing I've learned. The second thing is, to Mayor Nutter's point about um, the, uh, the statements and the number of statements and how this is different, again, public sector, yeah, it's the pronouncements and the proposals. Inside, it is a competitive environment for talent. And so when you are a company who is trying to get the best and the brightest and want to make sure that you're serving your community of employees, you are constantly listening for what are the signals that the employees are sending in terms of what's important. And so I would say that inside our company, there are, we are our first 
resource in terms of advice, in terms of what we're thinking. And I think any, any company who doesn't understand that they're being driven by the need for the race for talent um, in this environment is going to be left out of the conversation. So we are competing for employees. And right now, by some, you know, miracle, the competition is about doing the right thing and having values and equity. And so I just think, again, this is a moment in time when um, in some respects there are, private, there are some private sector companies that could actually be filling a very important void in the conversation. All right, and, so there's, uh, oh, okay, I Go just ahead. want to add one thing on to You know, I, I think that, uh, I mean, COVID-19 has, I mean, is definitely playing a role in what we're literally seeing playing out in the streets from, uh, I guess that was Memorial Day when George Floyd was killed. Um, and I mean it in this context. Everybody's at home for the most part, which is also giving people greater access to even participate in many of the protests. More and more companies, their employees are also going to be driving accountability issues for the company's mm -hmm. values because they've been in the streets. They've been experiencing the issues, again, that the black community has been talking about for decades and centuries, but now many of their employees who are not black are having their, for some, maybe their first true live real experience. And some, of the, some of those experiences will be very positive and you know, some of those experiences will be very negative. Uh, for, for some folks and to demystify as Shamina has used the word, you know, not everybody out demonstrating, you know, is some, you know, poor unemployed person. Of course. There are a whole bunch of folks who are, who are leaving their home office environment a little earlier in the day to go out to protest. But they're going to bring those issues and those values back to the workplace, whether they ever go back in the okay. office again, but they still work for that company. And people are increasingly going to be, okay, so we put out this statement. What does that mean? Because I was in the streets. Were you? That's right. Um, certainly true uh, in, in this employer that I know. Um, well, I'm going to, I think, leave the conversation there, but uh, say thank you both of, to both of you for being here and being part of this uh, conversation. <laughs> um, do you, Shamina, do you uh, want, have anything you want to add before we go? I just wanted to say to you, Sarah, and the Urban Institute, thank you for your leadership um, and your partnership um, and your expertise. Uh, without Urban's data, the research, the analytics, and uh, the, the, the placement on it, um, equality as a value, um, it served us very well, and we appreciate it. Well, you're uh, great. You. We are very grateful for the partnership. Grateful to you, Mr. Mayor, and grateful to all of you who have joined Thank us today you. for this uh, important conversation. Um, the event and others from the series have all been recorded and will be available on our website and would also encourage you to keep an eye out for the thank you email coming to you next week because it will link to uh, documents and things that were discussed in all of the events through the whole series. And we'll be putting out a new report next Tuesday also about some of our learning about how cities that have been using technology through the COVID crisis, what they're learning and where next they want to go. Um, so stay tuned for this ongoing conversation about innovating for inclusion. And uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Shamina. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Be well, everyone. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Stay safe. Good to see you, Shamina. Tell everybody what's up. Will do.